Today we are going to talk about how we are leveraging on the concept of GitOps to bring it into the next level with the power of Elixir combined with it. So a little bit about myself. I have been working in the tele telecom sector, building high performance servers with Arlang for over 10 years. Yeah. And <laughs> it was an awesome experience and I have to forgot some, forget some of that because Elixir does not need those things. But yeah, it will be an interesting talk, I, would, I hope. And um, yeah, with that, I will hand over to Lars to introduce into the subject. Thank you. Thank you, Bikon. Um, yeah, as you already know, my name is Lars. Um, I've also been working on the Beam for around 10 years, also in the telecom business. Um, but probably most known was the Vernon Q project, uh, the MQTT broker, which I was worked on with my uh, well, then back then, for now former colleague, but also current colleague. Um, and um, then I joined Helvetia also around three years ago. So um, let's get started. So first, give you a little bit context about what we do. Um, so let's say we are integration specialists. Actually, we are DevOps solution architects but integration specialist is a little bit more saying about what we, what we actually do. Um, so, and well, what we do is, is API management. Um, so what does this mean? This means that we try to bring order into the chaos of APIs. We don't want to have ad hoc connections between systems A and B. We need to create some kind of order in there. And when we say API management, we don't talk about just synchronous APIs. We talk about you know, synchronous APIs like HTTP. We also talk about streaming APIs, um, real-time APIs uh, using Kafka, uh, but also bulk APIs uh, using uh, you know, file transfers like uh, S3. So um, what do we build? We build self-services. Um, and why do we build self-services in Elixir? That is basically to decentralize work. Um, decentralization of work is really important in the enterprise because this uh, moves away from the, well, the classic setup where each team, when they want to have something done, like exposing an API or using an API, would hand over some information to another team where they then would you know, execute or implement uh, this API exposure or whatever it is. And then you, know, you would have to wait for that. And then when they come and say, oh, it's done, now then they can move on. Decentralization enables the teams to take control of their, uh, of their work. And you know, uh, it's basically empowerment. Uh, and also one of the goals, is, goals are to um, reduce lead times. That's always important. Um, and we are doing this using GitOps. And you know GitOps, I mean, it's, it's not a buzzword anymore, really. Um, you know, single sort of, source of truth and that kind of stuff. What makes it, uh, makes it special is that uh, we, we can't just, or for us, is that we can't just use the, the normal tools like you know, Argo CD, or plain Terraform in a Git repository because we need to adhere to and implement a lot of corporate um, processes and policies. There are rules from information uh, security and there are data guidelines and data policies that we need to take into account. So we need to do more than just the um, you know, standard GitOps, throw stuff into a Git repository and all is good. So that's why we call it on steroids, right? Um, so going back a little bit, 2019, we had this situation here. Um, we had built the first self-service. This is not in Elixir. This is a, a Jenkins pipeline. And that was basically uh, you know, the plain thing. You have a pull request. It gets merged. Then it gets reconciled. Although this was really great, there were a couple of uh, drawbacks. Um, the obvious, obvious ones were that the governance and review processes were manual. And this meant that basically our team needed to ensure that all the correct stakeholders uh, would be involved. So 
if I need to access something from another domain, then or a user wanted to do that, then we would have to make sure that a stakeholder from that domain would look at the pull request and approve it. And also, uh, this first self-service, uh, although it was really a huge step up uh, on this situation uh, that, that went uh, before, um, was that the abstraction level was a little bit too low, because in the uh, definitions that were stored in the Git repository, uh, you could see a lot of the underlying stack shining through, so there was a lot of um, uh, you know, technical stuff exposed to the users of this self-service. So, um, although a really good step, uh, it wasn't really enough. So, this self-service was for, for Kafka, that was the very first one. And then in 2020, after I joined, or around when I joined, we uh, did a, a second iteration where we then build it in Elixir. So um, that's uh, the orange box in, in the middle, um, where we basically added those two shortcomings from, from the previous iteration, where we added, um, before we would reconcile stuff, we would have a validation step, where whenever a pull request came in, a pull request event, then we would look at the pull request, and then we could uh, provide validation um, on the pull request to the user. We use at the point that point Bitbucket, and there you could uh, generate something called Code Insights, uh, where you could then tell the user all is good, or or you have this or that problem. It could be syntactic, or it could be you know, semantic, or or these people need to approve before we can merge it, and so on and so forth. Um, and this self service were built for uh, exposing HTTP APIs, and there we also succeeded in building an abstraction, which basically um, abstracted the, the whole tech stack away, right? So we see that, that for this self-service we were, um, or for HTTP APIs, we were reconciling uh, AWS and Kubernetes resources, um, and also the, the identity provider and stuff like that. But uh, the user didn't have to know about it. We, we were uh, lucky to, uh, to make uh, uh, an abstraction which kind of reflected just the, the problem domain. So, that said, let's uh, look a little bit more closer at the self-service application. So, it's built, of course, on Elixir OTP at the bottom here, and then we have a bunch of OTP apps. Um, at the top, we see uh, the, the central app, which is the, the operator, we call it, which is responsible for validating pull requests and also then doing the reconciliation. In the middle, on the right-hand side, we have a couple of, let's say, auxiliary applications, uh, Colibra and Linux. What they are, not so important, but they are reflecting external systems that we, that we have at Helvetia, uh, which we then use to uh, fetch information which is used during validation of pull requests um, and so on. And then we have um, these two uh, applications, and they are basically uh, the foundations of reconciling all our resources. So let's take a closer look at those. Um, so the Terraform application is then responsible for, or let's say we have all our uh, definitions in, in a Git repository, and now we want to uh, reconcile or provision a lot of stuff on AWS, and we are doing that via Terraform. So we have the um, we generate a lot of Terraform code using embedded Elixir, and that looks a little bit like like the stuff here on on the code uh, on 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 the slide. Just uh, we have a lot more, of course, but it's it's really just you know a simple loop for uh, for the definitions uh, that that are uh, important for this reconciliation. We will just generate a, a bunch of of uh, Terraform code. Then the Terraform app will uh, has a, it has a simple job queue, uh, so we can you know have uh, have a lot of, of things going on at the same time, and it will just you know uh, work them uh, or, or take them one at a time, or actually uh, several at a time is is possible. Um, and then using the task uh, modules, we can we can start uh, the provisioning. And we do that by just uploading all our Terraform code to Terraform Cloud which then handles the actual provisioning for us, which is uh, very uh, convenient. And um, 
so this is actually this is a very very simple app, uh, not many lines of code, but uh, gives us a lot of uh, uh, advantages um, for for our, our uh, self services. Uh, you know, it's like uh, it simplifies a lot. So um, though we are huge fans of Terraform. Um, not everything fits into the Terraform box. Uh, not uh, all resources have good Terraform providers. So we also had to come up with a different way of, uh, of provisioning some resources. And for this, we built uh, something called an HTTP reconciler, or as someone uh, termed it, it's a, it's a fat-free version of Terraform. And, um, the HTTP reconciler basically gives the, the possibility or makes it possible to model HTTP resources using Elixir behaviors. Um, and then you can, you can model these behaviors, you can list them, you can put them in a list, and then you can give them to this reconciler library. Um, and then it will do a simple uh, compare update loop. Um, it will build up a state based on you know, the remote uh, state of, of, uh, of the resources compared to um, the resource, or let's say the, the state that you want based on the input from Git. And you can see, I'm not going to go through the, uh, uh, everything here, um, but you, you see some, some obvious callbacks, like you need to define where to find the, um, the resources and how to create them and update them and delete them. Delete them. And then you have uh, you know, the init, which is, uh, is used to initialize uh, the resource based on the remote state, and then you have the data uh, callback, which is used to initialize this resource based on the state that we want, so we can do a comparison and update the resource accordingly. So those two um, applications are really the building blocks for uh, all the reconciliation that we do, and uh, that's really all that, that there is to it, in a way. But we didn't stop there. This is not the complete story. Um, that was not the final iteration. So I'll hand over to you to, to talk about the next level. Thanks. Thanks, Lars. So we sort of now understand that the building blocks were already there. So we had reconcilers. We know the concept, how it works. And we had multiple self-services. So then we started to collect some ideas about what would be the next iteration of the self-services. And we came up with this whys. So first off, it's too much integration. We want to decouple things, abstract things out so that you can manage them easily and not really affecting one component to the other. Especially the infrastructure code should be in a place which is like easily maneuverable and reusable from different business logic changes. We wanted to, in bigger organization, there is always something that you just cannot automate like that. So extended approval is one such workflow where you need to have a longer waiting time for the approval process to happen out of the loop. So maybe it's an email loop, or Lars mentioned about Linux and Colibra, if you remember those blocks. So that was our second goal. We want to have an abstract framework, and this is the basis of being able to build more sales services over the same pattern. So it be it an API operator or Kafka or S3, they essentially has a fundamental com commonalities among them in the process, in the structure itself. Then in terms of hardening of the code, we want to focus on fault tolerating. So it should be tolerant to, the da to individual state changes, but changes of one state should not affect change of the other. And here I'm specifically talking about each and every pull request. So they happen asynchronously and then it needs to be processed in a sandbox where it doesn't affect this uh, overall system performance. All of that actually surprisingly give us a simplified design. So we can make things easier by actually trying to take into account more. And we also get a lot more code reusability, so lower code, lower maintenance, and lower cost, of course. Uh, so how did we go about that? I'm a big fan of state machines. And I believe that many of the complex organizational or coordination problems which are long lasting, needs a longer period of time, but needs to wait in a certain state for a very long time, state machine patterns are the perfect uh, tool for the job. So if, we, if, we, if I put together what Lars described so far, the requirements and how the whole governance process goes, 
at a very high level, all the self services has these common parts. We start with checking the syntax of the pull request, whether what is written is written correctly. Then we see that if these changes is merged into the main branch, would it break the consistency of the configuration? So there needs to be the same, so like same Kafka topic name, same API permissions, and sort of things, nothing conflicting. If these two goes well, then we actually now wait for reviewer approval. Now, in this step, we actually also find out by incorporating business logic from Helvetia to see who are the stakeholders, who should be involved in such a change, and who, from whom we need these approvals. So they come in and we wait for their approval on the same pull request. Then what happens is the following. This is an optional step. So this is the extension that we have built into our framework now, which is called extended approval. So if such a requirement is defined by the self-service, then we will wait for that step, and that step can stay long. We, we are prepared for days even, so it's just a state machine, lives in the memory, and can live there forever. But again, optional. Now if that also comes through, when it comes through, we come to a final state, it's called ready to merge. So that that's beautiful spiral looks like a rosy road, right? I mean, it's, things does not fly that way all the time. What we have in the middle is damage control. So whenever any of this state fails, we wait for the changes. The only way to correct these failures is to push more commits into the same pull request. So we wait for those changes in the middle. And whenever such a change is pushed, we start the process over. So we go back, we check the syntax, consistency checks, and all that. So this high-level diagram basically gives you the idea of how the state machine is basically built. This is not this simplified. It's a little bit more integrated in implementation. But this will give you more or less the idea of how it looks like. Um, the state machine is an abstract construct that we want to use in many different self-services. So we came up with this interface of callbacks. The callbacks have an opaque state which has been piggybacked into the state machine, which then each and every self-service is free to manage however way they like. Um, the latencies of individual callbacks is the responsibility of the self-service which is implementing this behavior. So it's all quite free and dynamic for each and every implementation, still adhering to the same pattern. And of course, the implementation is as simple as this. So you just implement the behavior. Um, here you see this two of the behaviors that you have currently in production, these two self-services, uh, the, the ones that Lars talked about. Okay, so having seen these uh, state machines, how this fits into the, the application, the self-service application itself. So there comes the second part where on one of the self-service application, when it starts, it starts one of the GAN server processes as a permanent uh, process in the memory, and that's what we called provider GAN server. So provider here means who is providing the definitions for the self-service to work. So essentially, it's which repository that we want to monitor. Now, here we also did some abstraction. So uh, we started off with the Bitbucket as our source of repository. And then at some point of time, we realized that we might want to go to GitHub. There was a slight difference in the API calls. So we abstracted that uh, complexities out into callback modules. So you see that little blurred GitHub, which is coming next, whenever we are going to that, to that point. So when provider GAN server receives an event on, from the repository it is monitoring, that a new pull request is created or something has changed in an existing pull request, it either spawns a new state machine or send a signal to the state machine regarding this change. So PR1, pull request one, pull request two, pull request three, it keeps on managing this orchestration. Same goes the other way around. If a pull request is then closed, then it sends a signal to let the machine shut down. So that's the process cleanup bit. Now, all of them, like we saw the diagram before, waits for the final approval. Everything is green, and they get marched. When they get marched, the same provider again server gets another signal that this, there is a new commit in the main branch that I'm observing. So that signal goes to a new process. Now, this process, Again, part of the same application supervision tree. It's permanent. And it says that, OK, this is a trigger for me that something has changed into my source of truth, which I need to reconcile. Hence the name 
reconcile GAN server. Um, before we get into reconcile our grid server, I would like to quickly show you how our provider abstraction layer looks like. So you see there, we, we came up with the things that you started off by refactoring stuff. So these are the things that you identified is needed, but can easily be extended with the more interfaces as and when needed. Some of them are a little bit uh, obvious by, from their names, like refresh pull request or add reviewers. So they do basically how they are named. Um, and of course, very pretty simple one-liner implementation, fulfill the behavior pattern, and there you have yourself, uh, your provider for your new repository source. All right, now let's have a look at once things are being uh, pushed or merged into the main branch, what do we do next? That's reconciliation. It starts off with the reconciler GAN server from the slide before. And now I'm going to put things together with some parts from my, what I said a few slides before and something that Lars explained before. So this is how it looks like. So remember I talked about code reusability. So here is the first example of code reusability. The same code that you're using to validate a pull request is run here again. We just intercept or we just connect to that same piece of code and then we do the che syntax checking and consistency checking. This is a safeguard. Because given a repository, anybody with an admin rights can actually push the master branch and make some damaging changes, and we do not want our provision system to break down for it. So the reconciler will stop and not go forward if there is a consistency failure here at this point. Now, when this passes through, the first thing this reconciler abstraction machine will then go to the self service and ask, these are my definitions. How do you want to partition them? So, Essentially, if you think of, let's say, Kafka, if I take Kafka for an example, there are definitions of a topic and then definitions of different accounts and users which actually accesses those topic. So then comes the permissions and stuff like that. The different framework implements them differently. So here comes the concept of splitting by type. So we are group splitting the resources by their type, whether this is a topic definition or a service account definition, if I speak confluent. And then we have those groups. Now, after that is done, then self-services are individual implementation is free to combine those building blocks that Lars mentioned any way they like. So they can execute in parallel if resource A and B has no dependency to each other. So they, let's say resource A is a group of topics, resource B is another group of topics, they essentially has no interdependency, they can execute in parallel. If not, for example, if you are creating a secret and then you want to put the secret into another place, then you create a dependent pipeline. So you can say this resource dependent on the other resource, so self-service is free to, free to build those stuff. And as you see in my slide here, we can also freely combine different mechanisms of reconciliation. So HTTP reconciler or Terraform reconciler, they can all come into this mix and to complete the puzzle. And then it is quite obvious, every single reconciliation piece of the pipeline is, is uh, solely responsible for reconciling one resource. And here they are also responsible of consistency. So if something changed manually to the target system, which has deviated from the source of truth, then it's gonna fix it. And of course the regular addition and deletions and updates will all go in there. That's basically our wonderful world of Elixir. <laughs> Thank you, and with that, I hand it over to Lars again. Thank you, Pikam. Um, so I'm just going to, to recap a little bit how, how our, basically our journey looked. Um, Andre also showed a little bit yesterday. Um, in, around 2019, there was this first uh, Jenkins pipeline in place. Then in 2020, we started uh, building the Elixir services, cell services for, for S3, bulk transfer, Kafka streaming, uh, real-time data, re-implementing that, and then also the HTTP API cell service. And those <clears throat> all went into production in 2021. And then in 2022, we did then the, basically the third iteration of all the, uh, of the cell services with, uh, with the Git state machine, bringing more order into the code um, and all the other points that, that become mentioned. And um, then uh, in this year, we, um, 
we have uh, deployed the, the HTTP API and Kafka self services to production uh, using the Git state machine. So that's been a, been a quite a, a success so far. Um, so uh, our work doesn't stop there. We are also, so API management is not only about making APIs available and also, um, you know, being able to use them. You also need to be able to discover them, uh, find them, figure out who are the owners, and for that, a Git repository is not not the best uh, tool. Uh, so we're also building now a um, an API catalog in in Phoenix and LiveView using LiveView, and that might be a, be a story for for another time. We'll see maybe next year. Um, we can come and tell about what happened there. So um, thank you very much, um, and we would love if you got in touch. So I think we have time for questions. Yeah, we have time for one or two questions. <laughs> thank you, Lars and Vikram. We have a question here. Remember, you can also always post questions in the conference app, and the two of them can answer them later. So thanks both, great talk. Um, I love the state machines and the gen servers. Um, do you plan to open source that at some point? <laughs> it's a, thanks for the question. It's a, actually a very important question for our manager. So we always try to say that giving something back to the community actually gives you the help of the community to protect and maintain it. But bigger organization works slightly differently. So we have to find out when is a good time for something that is built inside Helvetia. Um, silo can be given out back to the community. Yeah. That's the that's short answer, <laughs> sorry. Uh, uh, add something? Yeah. So, and, and you know, committing or giving stuff back to the community is really something that is quite up there in our minds and, and it's something we want to do. We'll try to make it happen. Also the HTTP reconcile is, is it's kind of a beautiful small library um, and I think that would be be useful for others as well if you don't want to go the whole Terraform way or you know it's a kind of a lightweight thing and um, so so let's see I, I hope we can make something happen at some point but let's see thank you again for your interesting talk please give another big round of applause to Bikram Chatterjee and Lars Christensen yeah.